Hey you folks, my name is Levi Fredrickson. I'm the Applicant Experience Specialist here at Oregon Tilth, which means I get to serve folks like yourself that are considering organic or know that they'd like to apply for organic. And I'm here today to walk through the handling application for processors as well for organic. In other words, your what becomes your organic system plan. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. There may well be more that you'll need to do to complete your application for your unique business, but I'll touch on some of the main points that come up during my phone calls with a lot of you, things people tend to ask about, and just know that if you have further questions, if this video doesn't answer them, that's, that's great. Reach out to my team here at getcertified at tilth.org or at our phone number that's listed there, 541-201-8042. And my team will be more than happy to help you with any questions that you have about the handling processing application. So buckle up, hope you got your favorite beverage with you and hope this is useful as you work through your application. You can of course stop at any point and kind of go back, look over things and that's why we thought having a, a video of this walkthrough might be useful for you as a resource. All right, without further ado, let's jump into our application. If you have not yet received a packet with the handling application, please reach out to my team at that email provided earlier and make sure the application you have is the most recent version. So if we supplied it to you two years ago or more, or even last year, it's best to check with us and make sure you have the most recent version. We really don't want to have to ask you to redo everything after you put so much hard work into it. So make sure your forms have the current year or a year old dated on the bottom and we'll work with you to make sure you have the recent version. All right, the place to start here is the H1 form, H for handling. And this is a checklist that's really, really useful, I think. So let's uh, make that a bit bigger so we can all see it here. That looks pretty decent. I could zoom in a bit. Now, as I work through this checklist, I'm going to say, all right, in the first column on the left, here are various activities I may or may not perform. And then on the right, the corresponding forms that you would need to complete if you do those activities. So I'm, I will check more than one box, almost certainly on the left column, and then do the forms on the right. Everyone, the very first box, everyone will fill out Form 01, Operation Information. Just anyone applying for certification because that acts as your contract for certification with TILTH. So everyone's got to apply one that gets missed sometimes. We will go to that next. Then I'll check one of these boxes. You know, if I'm doing things that are actually, excuse me, processing based, I will probably do H2 through H8. I might do some more forms depending on whether or not I'm doing livestock. And we will not go into all those forms today, but we'll go into H2 through H8 because those are the vast majority of our applicants, all right? We'll go into some of the supplementary forms that a lot of our folks fill out, such as the MIL, MPL, and PFS. Then you can go through this, check them. If you are wondering what category you fall in, just reach out to us and we'll help you suss that out. There are some kind of unique uh, ones down here, such as doing a, a restaurant or something. We don't see a ton of those, but you know, reach out to us if you're in that category. And then also some folks are doing um, NSF ANSI 305. That's often with uh, cosmetics, personal care products. So we can provide you with additional application material for that scope if you fall in that category. But for most of us, we'll either be doing some sort of processing and do these forms or most of these forms, or we're doing something like brokerage trading or similar, and we'll do an abbreviated version. Now, I should say, if anyone, right now we're in the midst of SOE applicant season, because this is 2023. If you're watching this several years from now, it may be moot. But if you're an SOE applicant, meaning you're a broker trader similar, that was previously exempt until the SOE rule uh, took effect, then you would complete H2, H3, H8, and these corresponding ones. In other words, you fall in this category. So if you're on the fence, if you're wondering, get a hold of us, we'll be glad to help you sort out what is appropriate for an SOE application. Otherwise, the rest of us who are doing, you know, traditional processing, making granola bars or something like that, then we're gonna complete these forms. 
So let's jump into, like I said, at the very beginning, the place to start really is the 01 operation information because we all have to fill it out. So with this one, move it over, get my big melon out of the way. This form, I want to draw your attention to operation name at the top. Be sure to put a legal entity there that, how do you pay taxes for your business? Okay, an LLC, incorporated. It can be a sole proprietorship. It could be you and your partner your, um, if you're married and filing jointly. However you pay taxes for your business, that's what you want to put in operation name. It should be legally registered with the state. Okay, if you're planning on registering it, you'll want to either do that and then apply or you might have to change the name of the business later. But we need to have one and not more, not less legal entity in there. And we'll check with the Secretary of State just to make sure it's active. So if that legal entity you used, you quit, you know, sort of paying the renewal fees some years ago and it's not listed as active, that'll create some um, some problems down the line. If you wish to discuss expedited service with us, there's that option. We really only want folks to pursue that if they absolutely have to, because uh, at the time of this recording, it comes at the pretty significant fee of $3,000 in order to secure staff resources to cover that expedited service. So we'll gladly do it for you, but it really has to be worth it to you. Get a hold of us to talk about that. You can always put the date that you hope to be certified by. Maybe there's a production deadline for you. You want to be certified by October because you'll be selling product by then. Put it in here. That makes no guarantee we'll be able to meet that date. In the world of compliance, there are no guarantees on timelines because we have to make sure things are compliant with USDA National Organic Program, or NOP, as I'll say through the rest of this video, NOP guidelines in order to actually issue a certificate. So. We can't guarantee timelines. We can give you kind of a ballpark of what they typically take. Then some basic questions here. I won't go into great depth into each of these because they're straightforward. If you have a DBA doing business as or a fictitious name, something similar, absolutely put it here. If you have multiple DBAs, that's fine to put it here. But just please make sure that they're not registered legal entities like another LLC or another Inc or something like that because you cannot have more than one legal entity listed on an organic certificate. That's a USDA NOP rule. That's not just a, a tilth certifier rule. Okay. This is pretty important to put uh, current addresses completely in here. Uh, mailing address, it's fine to use a PO box. For your primary location to be inspected, it has to be a physical address. For those of you that are brokers and say, well, I don't have a big plant to be inspected, that, that's okay, but we'll need to sit down with you somewhere to go over your desk audit. And that can be an office. It could even be a home office if you need. We've done that before. That's not a problem for us as long as you're comfortable with that. But we need a physical location in here. It cannot be a PO box. Um, you don't have to put a billing address. It could be same as your mailing. But uh, we do need to have a location to be inspected and some sort of mailing address here. Legally responsible contact. Please do not skip this one. We need someone assigned that's uh, a legal owner in the business. This person does not need to reply to emails. They don't have to even see our emails. Okay, and by default, we will not write them emails unless you request that we do. The legally responsible can be the same person as the primary contact. No problem at all there. It's just we need someone designated that's a legal and someone as a primary. Now the primary is a little different because that person will receive all our emails or calls, or if you don't use either of those uh, mediums for communication, we, we can do paper mailing or find some sort of path forward. But that primary contact is going to serve as our point person for everything related to certification. So it's got to be someone who's able to check their emails regularly, able to answer the phone regularly, not someone that's going on vacation or leave soon or who just doesn't like checking emails. I mean, we all understand that feeling, but in order to keep your certification moving forward and to keep you updated and compliant, that primary contact has to be responsive. Um, it's up to you whether or not you assign a billing contact or additional contacts, but please be aware if you want anyone to make changes to your file over the years or ask about the file and say, oh, where are things at? or, well, I've got a new label or formulation, I want to add this to the file, 
they've got to be on here as an approved contact in order for our folks to even speak to them about the current status of your file or what's in your organic system plan. And that's all to protect you out of confidentiality so we don't get someone calling that, you know, is not part of the organization trying to find out, you know, sensitive information about it. If you need to, you can absolutely attach additional pages. And my friendly encouragement for you, any time in this application, you want to attach additional pages or supplements, you can always do that. We'll read every word. Maybe tell us in the file name what the attachment relates to, you know, if it's product formulations or contacts or labels, but uh, always welcome to add supplements. You don't have to feel confined to what's on our forms. All right, most of us here today watching this video are going to apply for handling, distribution, or something similar. Uh, you may be applying for other scopes at the same time, like crop or livestock, but this video today is just going over the handling application. And then almost everyone watching this will apply for USD NOP. That is the seal that we're all we all know and love of USDA Organic. And then in addition to that, if you're exporting to Canada, you might want the US Canada equivalents that will not cost any extra directly. Same as the European Union, if you think you'll export to the EU. Do us a favor and you know maybe don't mark these unless you reasonably think that you will export to these places in the near future. It's helpful for us to know what you'd reasonably be doing. So we can plan. Same with Mexico. We, we do offer, we're one of the certifiers that offer a LPO certification and are happy to provide that. That does come at an additional cost. So get a hold of us if you are exporting from the U.S. to Mexico for organic product. And then there's some other certifications I won't go into on this video, but you can definitely get a hold of us to discuss. All right, let's see what else here. If you have not yet received the applicable standards, so the organic standards from us, just let us know. I mean, we typically link them in our welcome emails so you have those available and please do review them. All right. And if you uh, have a chance, look at the OTCO procedures manual and our fee schedule. Those are all really important. Uh, it's good reading in the evening, you know, make a cup of tea and go through that stuff. We understand that they're somewhat lengthy, but really helpful, pertinent info. Now, and then some background stuff. If any other regulatory agencies inspect your operation, ever had a negative scoring, it's just fine to list it. It's much better to tell us up front than to say, nope, nope, never had anything, and have us find out the FDA, you know, uh, had some sort of negative comment from a couple years ago. So better to be upfront on all this stuff, of course. And then if you have a history of being certified organic, it's great to know about that here, although we'll easily find out about that anyway. All right. Those of our friends in California, there are special state uh, rules for the state of California and organic operations. If you are located in California or selling product there, I mean, based in California, not just selling from one state to California, but if you're based there, if your address is there, You'll need to very likely register with the CDPH, California Department of Public Health, to say I'm an organic processor. It's a simple application. It's relatively cheap, but we do need that done before we can issue an organic certificate. So don't wait. I would start that before I started this application for organic if I knew I was moving forward because we will need that confirmation before we can, you know, issue you an organic certificate. All right. And some basic info about fees. The rest of this is somewhat boilerplate. Those of you in a production partnership, I'll use our friends at Organic Valley as a great example. So Organic Valley is effectively a co-op that's managing these delicious, wonderful dairy products for a lot of uh, small farms or, and mid-size and large farms too. And um, they have an agreement worked out where they're getting you know some quantity. It's usually the lion's share, at least 75% or more, probably 100% of the dairy products from those farms, then they work out some um, certification fees. They'll cover part of it. So if you're in a production partnership or you're selling to a production partner that's certified by TILF, it's great to know about it here. Most of you folks already know who you are if you're in a production partnership or not. If you just have another business you work with that's not certified with Oregon Tilth, or if they're just another Tilth client that's your co-man, that's not quite a production partnership. So some of the details about that are here. And get a hold of us if you have any questions. All right, some stuff about membership. If you'd like to be a member, it's great. 
And if you provide any feedback about your experience, we will read every word and act accordingly. We appreciate feedback if you have a moment, so always helpful and great to hear. And finally, but not least, you'll definitely want to sign the bottom. Here's the good news. Thankfully, in this day and age, we can check the box, allowing for electronic signatures. And per our legal team, it's totally acceptable for me to type my name on the signature line as long as this box is checked. You don't have to print it out, wet sign it, scan it, hope the scanner works, upload it and send it back. You can just fill it in here or have the legal rep from the organization fill it in here. And by the way, it should be a legal rep signing, not you know someone that's just working in the warehouse that day. It should definitely be a legal authorized rep of the company, which all that language is here. That is the O1 in a nutshell, uh, pretty painless. Now let's go into the rest, the meteor part of the application. So facility information, and I'm going to have to do this whole uh, explanation folks, or this tutorial with kind of two groups of people in mind, processors who have a plant where they're making some sort of multi-ingredient product in that plant or similar, maybe, maybe they're doing an activity like repackaging, labeling, but they're doing some degree of processing. So that's one category. The other broker, trader, importer, dealing with finished goods that are retail ready or in their final packaging. Okay. So those are kind of the two categories. Now for, if I, if I'm a processing plant, I'm going to complete all of H2 because this is asking about your facility. And if I have multiple facilities, I will very likely complete an H2 for each facility. So we know you know, where's the address of it? Where's it located? What's going on at that facility? And you can give each facility itself a name. You'll have your operation name up here, ABC Packing, and then you'll have facility name, um, ABC Warehouse, and then DEF Warehouse for another one. So H2 for processors, you definitely want to complete the whole thing. I'll just say quickly that if you're a broker, trader in, in that category, you'll really only complete the first page of this. And you will complete it if you just have an office because you're just doing, you know, uh, movement of goods and it's all uh, from an office. You'll want to just list your office here. You will not want to list your co-man or co-packers or, you know, some sort of international entity's address because we don't need to necessarily inspect that. I mean, it should be certified organic already. All right. So you'll just list basically your office address here. I know that can be pretty confusing. That comes up a lot. Regardless, uh, there's some basic questions here about uh, what kind of processing or handling are we doing? This is a way for us to get to know you. Um, there's no right or wrong answer here, folks. Okay, no matter what you put, it just gives us a better idea of what you're doing. This is pretty important here, offsite facilities. If you're storing or distributing organic ingredients or products, we want to know about where they're being stored, even if it's just a simple warehouse that's doing nothing more than storage. And that's kind of the point of this. What's being stored there? And is this a certified organic certified warehouse or is it independent storage where it's not certified, but we know that they're covered as part of your organic system plan? And do you actually own this location? You know, are you uh, operating it yourself or is this a, a leased area or something like that? Okay. Then for those of you who are actually processors and uh, have a plant to be inspected or multiple facilities, you will be sure to attach a site map. It can be simple, hand-drawn, or it can be really complex computer rendered. I've seen some jaw-dropping examples of people's plants that probably had on file already. They didn't just make it for organic and really impressive. But what we need to see is essentially what most folks do is render a bird's eye view of the processing area and a product flow through the area. And sometimes people kind of put them together as one. Some people do them as separate. Here's a flow chart and then here's just a map. It's up to you how you go about it. But I'll say, well, all right, things are received at the loading dock. Then they flow through to the stainless steel tables where we take raw goods and start to sort them. Then they go through the bottling line or something here and into cases and then back to the loading dock and out on a truck. So that gives us a really good idea of how product flows through the facility that we're going to inspect. Really helpful for the, your team at Tilth and for the inspector. 
And then, you know, just basic description of what this process looks like. This is all pretty straightforward, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this. And most folks are pretty familiar with how to explain all this. All right, great. H2, fairly painless. H3, now this is real important for anyone with organic product, all right? And that includes brokers, traders, not just processors, but with our H3 form here. Give us just a basic cliff note on what you're doing. In this, it says juice production, not hull, hulling, you know, uh, cooling a product. You could tell us in just simple words, doesn't even have to be a full sentence, but a, the more descriptive, the better, about what you're doing for organic products in that facility. Then the ever important master product list. So some folks mm, understandably miss this one. But I like to think about it like this. Your master product list becomes your organic certificate effectively. So what you have on there fairly verbatim will become your organic certificate. So you really want to have that well organized and ironed out. And let's go ahead and just open the MPL here. Great. So I will only complete one master product list as an applicant. I'm not going to have 10 of them. I mean, almost, almost everyone for variety of reasons will just complete one of these for their file and you'll update it as it gets updated over time as you add products or remove products. So I'll put the name of my organic products on here. If there, if you're a co-packer and there's a brand that you're doing under private label or white label or something, you can put the brand name in here. If it's not applicable, that's fine. And then name of the certified uh, manufacturer co-packer if, if you're working with one. Okay certifier of the manufacturer so in this case if i'm if i'm a brand abc brand and i'm working with abc co-packer then i would want to list abc co-packers certifier here it might be oregon tilt it might be one of our sister organizations like qai ccof wsda whoever country of certified manufacturer so it does not have to be the united states and then if purchased through uncertified broker, trader, or distributor, we want to see the name of the uncertified supplier. So we're just getting a picture of the supply chain here. If you have someone in the supply chain that's not certified, and this is going to change a lot with SOE, by the way, they're very likely going to be certified. But if for some reason someone remains exempt and you're getting from them, uh, this is typical when someone imports organic product and they're just buying it from a broker, well, even then they'd have to be certified, but maybe a customs broker that might might be exempt, then you could list them here. So we just want to be sure that as this product changes hands throughout the supply chain, that everyone that needs to be certified is, and this is all to protect you, okay? The whole point of this is to make sure that you're actually getting product that is legitimately certified organic when it arrives at your storehouses or your processing plant. Then there's a little space about what kind of claims you want to make on it. And to what scope or to what um, equivalency trade arrangement is it certified? It's got to be a national organic program. When you're talking about bringing in product from other countries, it's got to be certified to NOP. So if I, unless it has an equivalence, by the way, if it's EU, that's a little different because we have an equivalence. But if you're bringing in organic product from, I'll take China as an example, it's got to be NOP certified there. It can't be um, some other, say, Chinese-based certifier that's determined it's organic, all right? And there's a long list of reasons for that, but a lot of it's just to protect fraud and integrity of organic products coming to the United States. Uh, we could go on about that for a while, but I think just for completing your MPL, that's a good start. So if you have 100 products that you want to do this year, great, list those. If you are only making 10 products right now, but you have all the assurances that you, by the end of the year, you'll make 100. Better to list them up front, if you can, during the application time, than to piecemeal add them one at a time throughout the year, because then we can review them up front during the application process, get them added to your certificate, so you're not having to request that we review them in the middle of the season when it might be really busy. So really better to add them up front. All right. I think that's enough about MPL. Then moving on, so everyone's done that. We can just go straight into the MIL, and that's Master Ingredient List. Now, this only applies to folks who are doing multi-ingredient products. The MPL, to be crystal clear, 
would apply if you're just a broker, or I shouldn't say just, if you are a broker or trader, then you're still going to complete an MPL because that becomes your organic certificate. But the MIL typically only applies when you have multi-ingredient products. So if you're a processor and for whatever reason, your products are just single ingredient, you're dealing with bulk quinoa flour or something cool like that, you don't have to do the master ingredient list necessarily because they're single ingredient raw ag products. But when I'm talking about multi-ingredient products where I'm formulating something with two or more ingredients in it, I'm going to complete the master ingredient list. This is like your, your spice cabinet, so to speak. This is everything that you have at your disposal that's organic to produce product with. All right, same, uh, real similar to the master product list. We're just checking with all these things to make sure that that ingredient you're using is current and compliant. And okay, my friendly encouragement again to you is if you list an ingredient here, be sure you can provide an organic certificate that has the ingredient in that form, in that exact form that you purchase it on. So if I purchase an ingredient like edamame, that's a good general one. Edamame comes in a billion different shapes and forms these days, okay? So if I just list edamame as an ingredient and I supply an organic certificate that says something like silken tofu on it, okay, or something like that, it might cause a little bit of a red flag for compliance. Um, it might cause some headache down the chain because I've just kind of put too general of a term in master ingredient and I can't necessarily as a, a reviewer or an inspector match up what's on your master ingredient list with what's on the organic certificate. However, if I put uh, something to the effect of dried edamame uh, sourced from, you know, this exact broker and it's, uh, you know, some quality to it, 70% XYZ, and that's exactly what it reads on the certificate, the organic certificate, then I can match those two up and say, well, yeah, I can identify this product. This is the same thing that's on your MIL. So just be sure whatever is on the organic certificate is also pretty verbatim on the organic ingredient name here, all right? That will save you a lot of uh, having to explain it down the line. And make sure that the organic certificate, the final thing I'll say here, make sure that organic certificate is recent. So it was issued within the past 18 months would be great. If it's a certificate that's two, three years old, we'll probably have to ask you for an updated one. If it's five years old, my goodness, I mean, that person who was selling it to you might have long surrendered their certificates. So make sure it's current. All right. It's a good habit to be in when you apply for any new product and it's got multi ingredients in it. Just be sure to include organic certificates. If you really want to make your reviewers happy and save time on your review, by the way, then what you can do is on the organic certificate, actually circle or highlight the ingredients that you're using. Cause some of these certificates are many, many pages long and it takes us a while, uh, even with finding stuff. To, to identify exactly which ingredients you're using. When you highlight or circle them, that's a great favor you can do for your team and just for your sake to ensure that it's on the organic certificate. All right, that's enough about the MIL, I think. And finally, similar to the MIL for folks who are actually processing multi-ingredient products, that's not broker, not trader, but processors, will complete a product formulation sheet for each of their products. So if I'm doing something like hummus, I'm going to put garbanzo beans, tahini, olive oil, garlic, all those wonderful things, uh, lemon juice that go in there. The percent organic content, you know, it might be 95%, it might be 100%, but it should correspond with what's on your master ingredient list. So you're basically taking things off your master ingredient list putting them on here and telling us what your formulas look like. Just to have it said out loud, you know, we will, we will protect in confidence your product formulation, but we do need to know what's in there. We, we can't just say, well, it's a trade secret, so we'll just hope that it's mostly organic. In order for us to review it, to audit it, and ensure it's compliant with NOP standards, we'll have to see the proportions of each ingredient and determine if it really is 95 or more percent, percent organic in the final formulation. There's a place down here for water and salt, and there's some cool auto calculations that make sure that 
you know, it's all tabulated right here. So, you know, water and salt are not counted toward the final calculation of 95% or more organic ingredients. If you have, uh, oh, be sure to put the product name up here as it appears on your MPL. So what's here should correspond with MPL. Great. If you want, folks, you can always just copy this over. So do multiple, well, you know how to do it. Do multiple product formulations all in one Excel file. That's great for us. No problem. If you'd prefer to save them separate, just name each one after the product name. That's fine too. It's up to you how you do it. But again, you really need a PFS for each of your formulations. Um, if, for those of you that have formulas, let's see, coffee is a good example. If you're blending coffee and sometimes the blend is part Ethiopian, part Yergachev, da 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 da. So it's, it varies a little each time, but it's always 100% organic beans. We have some wiggle room there in terms of what we can allow. Um, so you're not having to submit a PFS every time you do a, a, a new blend. So we, we can allow you to put ranges in there, but if you're in that category where you have uh, variations in how much organic content is in your blended product, get a hold of us and we'll help ensure that you have it right on your product formulation because um, we don't want you to run afoul of, uh, of organic guidelines in terms of you know blending those things. But there, there's some wiggle room if it's gonna be different for every batch is what I mean to say. Cool. I think that's hopefully enough about the product formulation. And what we can do now is go back to our H3 because we kind of jumped away from that because each of these questions on the H3 is asking about master product list, master ingredient list, and your product formulation. And you'll notice here for brokers, traders, you may put no ingredients sourced. And you may also put single ingredient or finished products only. So a lot of our brokers, traders do not have to do MPL, or excuse me, MIL or uh, the PFS. All right. Then a couple of questions about how do you make sure that your ingredients that you're using are current? And like I said, the organic certificate should be 18 months old or less. And most, most of our clients are using valid certificates that you have on site. And that means on a drive or a computer or physical copy of those organic certificates. And you're at least once a year reviewing those certificates, making sure they're current and asking your ingredient suppliers for updated certificates just to make sure they're still certified. If your co-packer is doing it, that's great. Just make sure to check with them and see if that's something they're doing. In, in theory, they should be, but um, you'd want to ensure that they are uh, keeping current organic certificates on. And maybe you have some other system for ensuring that your suppliers are uh, compliant. How do you verify that only compliant ingredients are used? So this is making sure you know you can always get a hold of your team at Oregon Tilth and say, is this ingredient that I want to use compliant? Is it current? Is the supplier actually organic? Or, you know, maybe it's from a, a co-packer you're working with or some other process. The rest of this stuff is, you know, all to that end. Just making sure you know and are in the habit of getting current organic certificates. And that you're checking with people in your supply chain, like co-packers and, and related entities, that they actually have updated certificates and, and uh, the records are reflective of that. Okay. Now, finally, we get into a bit about labeling. Okay, so I can sum this up pretty simply. If you have a label, the best thing you can do is take that draft label and send it to your team at Oregon Tilth. Once you're in the process of review, meaning with your application, send that draft label, and I'm really emphasizing draft. We'll review it and we'll let you know if everything's compliant. If something is out of compliance, We'll get back to you, we'll call out what that is, and you can update it. Eventually, you'll get an approval letter from us for that label, and then and only then can you send it to the printers. If you accidentally, well-meaning, make a label and say, I'm really sure it's compliant, and send it to the printers, we've seen some heartbreaking scenarios where people did that, and they only found out later, maybe the product was on the shelf, maybe, hopefully we caught it sooner than that, but. Uh, they found out that that's a non-compliant label and they basically could not use those. I mean, maybe they could get away with stickering the labels. That's a huge pain. 
and maybe they had to throw them away altogether. And all of us here today know the cost of labels in terms of time, in terms of just cost per unit. I mean, tens of thousands of labels you would not want to have to throw away. So really be sure to send that to us and we will approve it and let you know and then you can send it to the printer. Okay. International labeling compliance. This is basically if you're doing any exporting, are you familiar with what you know, things need to look like in the country, uh, the destination country for the product? I won't harp on this a lot. It's pretty straightforward. I mean, not necessarily straightforward. There's a lot of regulations for each country and what the labels look like. But if you're doing those activities, you're, are you aware that they each have their own unique requirements? All right. And beyond, I mean, most of this is pretty straightforward check boxes. So if you have questions specifically on any of these, just reach out to us because this is getting somewhat nuanced and won't necessarily apply to everyone. By the way, folks, if you read a question you're, and you feel like this doesn't apply to me, of course, you can leave it blank. Um, it's helpful for our team if you check something like other and say, because then instead of blank, we don't know if you read it or not. We thought, well, maybe they just got, you know, sidetracked with the application and did not do this part. But if you put NA, we've, we know that you read it and determined that it doesn't apply to your operation. So NA is always really preferred to just leaving it blank if, if you're able to. All right. Let's move on to, we're going to skip H4 because that's all about livestock feed. If you're a livestock feed operation, you're formulating livestock feed, get a hold of us and we'll happily talk you through this. We don't, I mean, most of our handling ap application or processing applications are not livestock feed. We definitely serve a number of livestock feed operations and are happy to talk about H4. And by the way, H9, similar livestock auctions, H10, transport. So I won't go into that in this video because most of the people watching that's not going to affect. H5, sanitation and water. Okay, so within the plant, again, this is, if you're a broker trader, you could skip ahead in the video to where I'm talking about H8. You will not have to do H5, 6, 7. Uh, very likely you would not have to do H5, 6, 7 if you're a broker or a trader and you're dealing with sealed organic goods. But for those of us with processing plants, You'll definitely want to do five, H5, 6, 7, and also 8. What we're looking for here is, um, is this talking about the facility on H2. If it's the same one, great. If this is a different one that you're doing cleaning and washing in, we'll need to know about that. And then in that facility, so what are you using for cleaning and sanitizing? Now, I like this part. A lot of people are surprised when they talk to my team how generous the organic guidelines are in terms of cleaning products. Some people have the notion that they can only use certified organic cleaning products or um, OMRI listed cleaning products, and that's not the case. There's a lot of stuff you can use for cleaning provided you follow use restrictions. The use restrictions are generally really common sense. If I have isopropyl alcohol and I clean off my stainless steel tables with that, the restrictions are usually something to the effect of it has to evaporate completely before I put any organic product on that food contact surface. If it's a soap, I have to rinse it thoroughly. Okay, the only compounds that really create some hurdles for people in terms of compliance are quaternary ammonias. If that just sounds like mumbo jumbo, uh, don't worry about it. But you, some of you are using quats, as we often call it in the industry, and those can still be used, but it requires a tight use restriction on making sure there's no residue of uh, ammonia left on there. So you got to monitor that with test strips, da, 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 da. If you're using quats and you really still want to use quats, uh, just get a hold of us and we'll talk out that use restriction so you don't run afoul of the regulations around it. Okay. Other than that, what most of our handling operations do is take their cleaning cabinet and take all the products out, Joy, Dawn, Cheer, all those nice uplifting names for cleaning products. They take a picture of the front label and the back label, put it on file, send it to us, and we'll make sure to list that on your organic system plan as a cleaning compound and make sure that you know the use restriction around it. And over here is, well, if you have a rinse step or an evaporation step or something like that, how do you document that? Do you have a cleaning log that says, yep, the folks came in in the morning, scrubbed everything with soap, 
rinsed it off and observed that there was no soap residue. I mean, that, that's all you really need to write, but you do need an auditable record that shows that. You can't just say, well, it's common sense, it's in my head. Not an audible record. All right. And so there's different, you know, surfaces we might use. Um, cleaning sanitizers just list as much as you know on here and we'll work with you and ensure all those products are on your organic system plan. If you want to add a new one, just email your team at TILF. Once you have a team assigned, they'll be happy to review it for you. But, you know, don't just despite what I just said about it being generous in the allowance, don't run and use a cleaning product willy nilly without letting us know. I mean, anytime you're using something in your organic system, you will want to ensure that it's on your uh, organic system plan and approved. And again, that's all to protect you and to protect your product and compliance for sale. All right, moving along, some basic questions about what goes into those cleaning products. Well, let's see, there are some allowances for purging. Uh, some people use purging of food contact equipment and that's typically something to the effect of, oh, so I'm making organic, let's take smoothies. And I run these smooth, fruit smoothies through some sort of uh, bottling line or something like that. Say I'm doing a, a non-organic form and an organic form. If I have a bunch of non-organic form and I ran it through, I may need to clean everything out. Or I may be allowed to purge it where I run some quantity, like, I don't know, 100 liters, let's say, of that organic smoothie through. And I sell that just as non-certified organic. And then it's determined that that's sufficient quantity to be considered a purge and get all the, you know, the residue of uh, non-organic out of the bottling line. So th there may be cases where purging makes sense. If you think you're one of those cases and you want to talk out your system for purging, we'll be happy to talk to you about it. Of course, we'll review this as part of your initial review at the beginning of the application, and we'll let you know if adjustments need to be made. Right. And yeah, that's all pretty straightforward here, I think. I don't hear a lot of people have issues in general with this part about uh, cleaning sanitation. Water additives come up a little more. You know, some folks are in situations, most of our processors are in situations where they're using municipal water. So it's not going to create headaches there. I mean, it has some chlorine in it probably, um, or, or some sort of, but that's all monitored by the water district by the municipality, okay? Uh, if you're in a system where you're not using municipal water, like a, if you're in a well water system, that's fine. But we just want to be sure that that water doesn't have anything prohibited in uh, undue amounts, you know, at least it's in non-detectable limits. Uh, and so it probably we'd want to see a water test or have you test your water at least once to ensure that. It is relative. Everyone's a little different. It's a case by case basis, but I mean, that's everything about water um, use in a nutshell there. And then finally, for those of you using boiler additives or steam or something, there's some specific questions on those. Um, if you want specific guidance around boiler additives, you can look some up on our website. Also, I believe OMRI Omri discusses a little about boiler additives, but I know um, the Oregon Tilth website has some resources on it. And again, we're always happy to talk to you about it. Basic question about monitoring at the bottom. So what are you doing annually or monthly or something to make sure that these practices listed above are effective? And that's a common theme with organic is continuing improvement that you're monitoring and you're ensuring your organic system plan is robust and has integrity. Cool. That's H5. H6, so receiving, storage, and packing, and shipping. This is pretty important because we're talking about movement of goods. In light of SOE, strengthening organic enforcement, this is more important than it has been ever before, perhaps. So what does it look like when you're receiving product? Where is it coming from? Do products arrive unsealed or permeable packaging? All this is to get a picture of what it looks like at the loading dock, to put it one way, or what it looks like you know, at your storehouses and if that stuff is sealed. When we talk about you know, truly sealed packaging, that, that's not a big bulk tote that could you know, open the flap and take some sort of raw ag product out. Sealed is like uh, herbal tincture that's 
uh, wrapped and uh, would obviously, if I were to tamper with it, you know, it'd be evident. Um, so this is a, more and more a theme every year with organic or an important key principle is what is the potential for contamination based on the packaging of that product? And we want to get a really clear picture just to ensure your product is protected from contamination. And if it's unsealed, that we take appropriate measures to ensure that there's not potential for contamination, right? Most of this is straightforward. I do not get a lot of questions on this part of the form. Uh, for those folks that are just simply storing in a warehouse, what does that look like? Um, ethylene's a common one for fruits or CO2, you know, some sort of atmospheric modifier. Again, there's paths forward for those typically, but we'd want to know what they are. And then when they are in storage, I mean, this is kind of a simple question, but it is really important. How do you ensure that the organic products are not commingled with non-organic? In other words, if I have some totes and those totes have uh, Rice Krispie bars organic in them, I'm just making stuff up at this point, then those organic Rice Krispie bars, uh, if they're sitting in a tote and there's one right next to it with non-organic Rice Krispie bars, it's a high potential for contamination for someone to come in and sneak a couple at lunch or something and accidentally put them back in the wrong tote when they get, you know, someone opens the cooler door and they get caught. That's kind of a crazy example, but you see what I'm getting at, that is there reasonable potential for contamination based on how you're storing them? And if there's potential for contamination, what measures are you taking to ensure that won't happen? Maybe you could do a system of colored totes, maybe all the organic stuff is stored in one cooler and all the non-organic in another. So if there's a mix up in the cooler, it wouldn't matter as much. People, there's a million different examples of how this could play out, but there has to be something in place. And by the way, I say there has to be something in place. It also has to be written down as an SOP. So again, auditable record. We can't just say, oh, well, in Levi's head, there's a system of blue is non-certified and green is certified. And so therefore, anyone that works in my warehouse is going to assume or know that. Okay, so it's got to be on an SOP. And for packaging and shipping, again, this stuff's relatively straightforward. It's asking about packaging materials most of those that you folks are using are not going to create huge compliance hurdles for organic. The one exception I hear once in a while is uh, cardboard impregnated with synth synthetic fungicide. So we have uh, raw produce that's being shipped in cardboard boxes, something like peaches that get moldy really easily. And the producer of the cardboard box will impregnate it with a fungicide to help you know reduce some of the mold uh, or control some of the mold. So we definitely would want to review that if that were a case. If you're using plastic packaging, it's, it's very unlikely that it's going to create any issues because it's inert, right? Okay. Most of those are straightforward. Again, I don't get a ton of questions on that. For monitoring, please don't just skip over this because it's the last one and there's one little line. It's maybe a little deceptive we leave one line. You can wrap on this as long as you feel is necessary, but... You know, how, who's checking in as part of your organization, making sure that this whole program for receiving storage, packaging, and shipping uh, is effective? And is there some sort of system for auditing and improving things if you determine like, well, there's a huge potential for contamination suddenly and we're paying attention, so we noticed. So this is a chance to talk about how you continually improve the process over the years. Great. Moving right along, H7, the facility, pest management. This one does cause more questions than you may think. But thankfully, the answers are somewhat simple. So we all deal with pests to some degree in a facility, whether that's just a couple flies buzzing around or a crazy infestation of, uh, oh man, what was the one I heard? Hobo spiders or something, or brown recluse. Yep, that was a thing. A terrifying thought. So, whatever your pests may be, you probably have some plan in place for controlling them. Or maybe you don't really have an issue with pests and you're lucky, but it's always possible that there would be an outbreak. What are you going to do when that outbreak occurs? Okay. 
And mm, let's see, conventional operations or non-certified organic operations sometimes just resort to, well, yep, just fumigate it, okay? I'm not restricted in what I do, so I'm just going to use a big old hammer and knock everything out. And they're not certified organic, so they might be able to do that. In your case, what we're doing is trying to develop an integrated pest management plan. It's a fancy way of saying, I'm going to use many little hammers to start. And if those little hammers, all those different tactics are not adequate to control this outbreak of cockroaches, then I'll go ahead and resort to calling Orkin or Good Earth Pest Company or whoever, um, you know, large, uh, wouldn't have to be large, but a pest control contractor that would come out and control it for you. So many of our clients have a contracted pest control company. Thankfully, these days, many of those pest control companies, <clears throat> excuse me, are familiar with serving organic clients and they have a program or a protocol in place for ensuring that they meet the um, USDA NOP guidance around it, or at least that they're communicating about it properly. So they've, they've come a long way and we appreciate that, but they're not going to do it for you, by the way. They're not going to take care of compliance on your behalf here. So who's responsible for this? Do we do it in-house ourselves? You know, do you use a, a fly swatter? Or are you actually contracting with a company? And if so, who are they? Do you have, have you let them know you're organic in writing? That's pretty big. You don't want to just say it over the phone because the person on the phone might forget to tell the rest of the company. You really want to inform them in writing. So if something ever comes to this, you at least did your due diligence in letting them know you're organic. And then we want to get a picture of what kind of pests you deal with. Okay, hopefully it's not brown recluse spiders. Which of the following management practices do you use to prevent pests? Um, my friendly encouragement here is don't check this unless you're actually doing it or you're really sure you'll commit to doing it this year. We have some folks well-meaning who check all of them because they sound cool. But then come inspection, the inspector you know, rightfully asks, well, can you tell me a little bit about each of these things you're doing that you checked? And our applicant says, oh, I, I'm not actually doing them. I just hope to in five years or 10 years. So you want this to be reflective of your plan for the near future, meaning this coming year or something. All right. Again, there's no right or wrong answers here. If you're not doing any of them, you could always mark other and put, I'm not doing any, honestly. We may talk to you about that, uh, meaning find some compliant path so you have an integrated pest management plan that may prevent these outbreaks from occurring in the first place. So you don't always just have to simply resort to a fumigation bomb. All right. And then there are some common pest control measures that uh, these come up a lot in all kinds of processing operations. There's sometimes restrictions on how these can be used, you know, uh, rat bait, vitamin D3. Uh, that can be used, but you know, it depends on where it's placed in the facility. Okay. Um, and so any, any of these, that's all to say, have some degree of restriction. We just want to be sure you know what they are. So the inspector doesn't show up and say, well, there's rat bait all over your stainless steel tables that that may be a non-compliance in this case because it's right up near your food you're processing probably you're not doing that but you get the point of the example right and then if you are using heavy hitter substances to control pests i mean really powerful synthetic pesticides there may be some allowance for it we need to know what it is exactly uh, the brand name, the material. Great to take a picture of the label if you have it. What pest you're targeting, how you're doing it, you know, what triggers the need to do it, that sort of thing. And this is, again, all of this is just to ensure we mitigate any risk of getting uh, contamination into your food product because we do test, as certifiers do, um, we do test to protect the organic supply chain, protect the integrity of it. And if we found that some of your product had well, you know, some sort of synthetic pesticide in it, then that might uh, remove all of that uh, product from the system. You might have to recall that product or you might get a non-compliance or worse because that product is uh, contaminated with a non-organic substance. So, ounce of prevention worth a pound of cure, right? All right. And then how do you prevent pest control materials from contacting organic products? Again, fairly common sense, but you'd be amazed at some of the stuff we see. 
And how this is big, how are you recording when you are doing things like monitoring your pests? All right. So if you see an outbreak of roaches, you know, don't just immediately call Orkin or whatever pest control company you're using and say, yep, get over here and fumigate. You want to log it somehow and show that you've tried to use integrated pest measures before resulting to the big guns, so to speak. And then like the other forms, the final question is, what are you doing for continuous improvement? How are you monitoring these practices and seeing if they're effective? Great, that is PESS. Finally, I think we're there, yeah. For this video, because 95% of people watching, I would guess, H2 through H8 will be, and SANS H4, will be the bulk of their application. There's a couple of, uh, by the way, with the supplements, I also brought up MPL, MIL, PFS. But for those of us watching today, this should be the cherry on top. This is a place to finish strong. Some of our folks get through the application and read record keeping and go, oh, I'll just submit the application as it is. Or, or they glaze over this. This is not the one to lightweight work on, okay? This is, in some ways, 90% of organic is how you keep your records, okay? I'd like to tell folks that because a lot of us keep records in our heads. And when we come to organics, for some of us, the hardest part is getting used to keeping good records that you keep available that are auditable. OK, but once you get that system down, the rest is hopefully uh, very manageable. Where do you keep your records? This is important because and you don't have to have physical records, by the way, they can all be on a drive. They can all be electronic, but you have to be able to access them somewhere. So you could put your office here if, if it's all on a drive, that's great. And the day the inspector comes there to inspect your facility, you'll wanna make sure that you can access those records. So if you're at a site where it's like on off spotty internet, you might wanna have a backup hard copy. We can't complete an inspection unless you can access those records readily, all right? And if you're keeping them in binders, we you see, for example, that's fairly common like our dairy clients and that's great. But it, make sure you can find the binders, preferably like the day before inspection, just so you don't run into having to run around and look for the binder um, where your Labrador ran off with it. Because that will take the inspector's time and then cost you more money or they might have to come back later to complete it. So really make sure they're available a day ahead at least of inspection. Do you keep your records for a minimum of five years? You don't have to have records today when you're applying from five years ago, thankfully. You might not have had your business five years ago, but you do want to start keeping them, your organic records going forward for five years. So in 2028, the inspector might, for some reason, ask me if I have a record of that product formulation that I or that product that I ran back in 2023. And in theory, I should have that record readily available because it's within five years old. When sourcing organic ingredients products from an uncertified broker, this is only if you're sourcing from an uncertified broker trader. This is going to be less common to answer this question in the future. But for now, if you're doing that, what are you doing to ensure the integrity of that product and that it's actually a certified organic product in the first place? In other words, that that uncertified broker trader received it from a certified organic operation or that it accompanying that product was an organic certificate that was current. Then when you're importing organic products or ingredients, import's a big one. We really want to see all the appropriate records, whether that's bill of lading, um, it, certainly the organic certificate from the NOP accredited certifier overseas, you know, whatever records need to accompany that import. We'll want to have those readily available. And if you're wondering what those records should look like, we have a whole team of folks who are very seasoned in helping you through the process. They actually issue transaction certificates um, for folks involved in uh, international trade. Okay, just wanted to make a plug that we do have a team of folks here that deals with those. And um, sometimes, you know, stuff gets has to get fumigated when it's going on a ship overseas and you know we want to see that there's some sort of uh, monitoring um, capability of that and that it would get communicated to your certifier for tracking organic products okay for um, we do want to see a, a system of audit traceback meaning if i buy 
1,000 units of XYZ ingredients, and I buy 2,000 of another ingredient, and then I'm producing 1,000 units of product, all, all of that should make sense in terms of what comes in and what goes out. Now, if I'm buying like 1,000 pounds of tomato sauce, or excuse me, just raw tomatoes, 1,000 pounds of tomatoes, but I'm selling 10,000 pounds worth of tomato sauce, that's a pretty big red flag, no pun intended. But, you know, it's, it's a little more intricate than that. We're not just going to generally say, well, what do you buy and what do you sell and wait? It'll, it'll be looking more like, okay, we want to trace a product. And typically what an inspector does is picks a product that sounds fun and says, let's, let's trace this product. We'll say um, crispy edamame. By, why do I keep going to edamame? Well, little soy snacks. And say that was soy snack, had wasabi powder on it, some other cool stuff. So all those ingredients, the wasabi powder, the, the edamame, what goes on to that and where did that come from? Can we trace each of those ingredients? How many did you produce? Where are those now? You know, you don't need to necessarily know that they're at Levi's house hiding behind that couch where I keep all my snacks. We need to know just through the supply chain up to the next point of sale. So when they leave your custody. Where did, you know, those 10,000 units of product go? Or are they in a warehouse still? Like what happened through the supply chain as you were buying and selling? I mean, most of you, I, I shouldn't harp on this too much because most of you are really familiar with Audit Traceback because your business is already heavily engaged in that just for your own record keeping. You likely have a very good system in place. If this is new to you, that, that's okay. We encourage you to keep it simple to start and you can get more complicated as time goes on. As I tell a lot of our crop applicants or livestock applicants, no need to download any fancy software and have a steep learning curve that makes this a big headache for you because we don't require that. You can do this all on notebook paper if you want, okay? But we, we have to have some robust system in place that is decipherable at inspection. That's my other friendly encouragement here is whatever your audit traceback system is, the person that meets the inspector should be abundantly familiar and able to explain it. So if there's a bunch of lot numbers in there and the inspector says, okay, well, what's this lot number, you know, tied to if that person says, well, I don't know, that'll be problematic. So whoever is meeting the, like coordinating the inspection should be abundantly familiar with your audit trail traceback system. Here's a neat thing you can always do during application is attach samples of to show us you have a robust system, the more you give us up front during application, the more we can evaluate, in other words, review or audit your system and help you determine if it's compliant and if it's robust and, and good enough to, you know, pass inspection as it were. I mean, the inspector is not going to pass failure per se. They're just there looking to uh, determine, you know, major points of compliance and report back to us if there's any um, serious non-compliances. Okay. Describe the record system uh, to track inventory of products. So in out balance, um, that is like what I said earlier. I guess I kind of in my explanation of audit traceback for ingredient purchasing talked about inventory too. Maybe I should have separated those, but you get the picture where what comes in and what goes out. You can attach samples of that. So um, there's got to be some system to track that. All basic good business stuff here, but. You'd be amazed how many businesses out there do not keep these sort of records and anywhere auditable. Most folks some have uh, some sort of lot numbering system or some way to trace it back, you know, or batch system. Okay, we're just trying to get an example. If you don't want to fit yours into this space, it's fine to just provide a supplement with your application that shows it. And then how is your lot number associated with outgoing shipments on invoice, bill lading, pick list, ship list, pretty typical. Then the cherry on top question here, same as all the other forms, is monitoring. So what are you doing for continuous improvement to ensure that these record keeping practices are effective? If you're getting feedback from your inspector or from your team at Tilth that they're falling short or you're having a big consternation uh, moment during uh, inspection on, well, I just can't explain my lot numbering system to the inspector, it's probably time for some improvement and we'll be happy to work with you on that. Okay, but what are you doing to monitor the effectiveness of those practices? That's it, folks. That's as simple as it needs to be. And hopefully you heard some things in there that you found, you know, helpful. If 
you want to at any time reach out about specific questions. My friendly encouragement, if you have just one or two questions, email them away because we can get back to you pretty quick. So you can email them to get certified at tilth.org. You can also give us a call, 541-201-8042. And we'll be happy to address questions that are more complex over a call. We're on the phone a lot. So don't be surprised if you call and have to hold a bit because we're talking to someone else or have to leave a voicemail. We will call you back when we're able. But for one or two questions, even three or four, it's great to have written correspondence. You can also get a hold of my team through email and set up a, a scheduled time for a phone call of up to 30 minutes. And that works great to knock out questions. What a lot of uh, our applicants do is give it their best shot, go through the application, circle parts that are you know, tricky or don't make perfect sense to them. And then over the phone call, we can kind of nail down, okay, on H2, section 2.1, da, 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 da. And we can go down your laundry list of questions and on one 30-minute call, easily knock all those out and make sure you're fully comfortable. If it takes more than one 30-minute call, we'll do it for you. You bet. All right. Well, my encouragement, folks, is just, you know, reach out with any questions because there's a whole team of us here for you and we're super happy to help. We look forward to uh, having the chance to answer any questions about organic and to hopefully be your certifier one day. We thank you for watching. All right. Bye-bye.